topping off the cub, $6.99 a gallon. Could be worse, might get worse, but at least it's not a barren, which would load test the old Visa to about $1,400 for a top off. This airplane is approved for unleaded MOGAS, car gas, but we don't have it on the field and I don't feel like hauling it in in cans. I guess I'm lazier than I am cheap. So I burn leaded 100 octane gas. You know, 30 years ago, we outlawed the use of lead in car gas, but we're still using it in avgas. Why is that? The asterisk. In part one of this series, I explained that aviation was given special dispensation to continue using lead as an octane booster because no suitable substitute had been found. To understand how the inertia preserved the status quo, consider that in the oil business, the upstream segment is where the profits are. Not so much in the downstream refining, although they're getting some nice windfalls lately. Only a handful of refineries make leaded avgas, and although most every refinery makes alkalate, the chief component of both leaded and unleaded avgas, only a very few have an expensive energy-intensive alkalate splitter column required to separate the heavy alkalate not acceptable for avgas. Small volume or not, avgas does have a nice profit margin, so you can imagine the young product manager telling his boss the company needs to spend maybe 20 million bucks to develop an unleaded fuel to sell into a market that's declining and by the way, it will cost more to make, have lower margin, more competition, and the government isn't making us do it. But we should do it for the good of the planet. If any of the avgas producers funded their own serious research on unleaded avgas, they kept quiet about it. Complicating this was that the FAA insisted the replacement fuel should look and perform just like leaded avgas. This is a so-called drop-in. But the oil companies did throw some money at an industry group called the Coordinating Research Council, which did do episodic research on unleaded fuels using FAA test facilities. An astonishing 279 blends were examined not so much to identify a specific fuel, but to sort of say, you know, if you're serious about unleaded gas, you might try some of these ideas. And this bore fruit in a half-assed kind of does anybody really care sort of way. The research was focused on anti-knock performance and it found as many as a dozen promising blends. But these weren't evaluated in anything near as rigorous as a certification program and things like cost of production and pricing, aging, deposit formation, and climate performance weren't investigated. Some of them used exotic ingredients. Bottom line, no rabbit out of the hat. Still, anyone, anyone, anyone? could have pursued these ideas. If they did, we never heard about it. Maybe because and also because fuels are FAA blessed as part of the engine and aircraft certification, not as fuels themselves. If a new fuel comes along, it's a giant hairball to certify it for hundreds of engines and airframes. Who's going to test and certify it? Not the manufacturers. They wanted to drop in fuel that requires no aircraft modifications and minimal regulatory hassle. They were waiting for the FAA to lead the process and maybe they'd get on board then. Or maybe not. Meanwhile, out of the blue around 2009, EPA woke up and revealed medical studies on airborne lead pollution risk to children and it promised to study the situation at the nation's 13,000 airports, which everyone knew were the leading source of lead pollution. Finally, was this the wake-up call everyone had been waiting for on lead regulation? Well, these guys thought it was. That's George Brawley and Tim Rule of General Aviation Modification, Inc. It's an Oklahoma mod house well known for its precision fuel injectors and aftermarket turbochargers. They happen to have the most sophisticated engine test cell in the U.S. and they set off on an improbable quest to do what the major oil companies had not done, develop a suitable 100 octane unleaded aviation fuel. That was 12 years ago. Moving at the speed of chilled 50 weight oil, the FAA got things going in 2013 with what it loves to do. 
a four-letter program, this time called PAFI for Piston Aviation Fuels Initiative. Finally, in a bold stroke, the FAA would lead the charge and the oil companies would enthusiastically follow. Except, not exactly. Exxon, Chevron, and Phillips, the three big avgas producers, said, eh, we don't think so. The rules of engagement were decidedly anti-science. Shell was the only major to semi-seriously commit to PAFI, although Phillips did have a deal with Afton Chemical to develop an octane additive. BP, Total, and a Swedish company called Helmco formed a consortium and volunteered a package. The FAA winnowed out all but two candidate fuels, Shell and Swift. This process raises one big question. In the free market, do we really want the government spending our money to pick the winners? Or do we want free and open competition to accomplish that? So what was supposed to happen with PAFI and what did happen? Well, here's the PAFI mission statement. The FAA says PAFI wasn't intended to approve a specific fuel, but to identify fuels that would suffice and would be able to wind their way through an absolutely Byzantine process for fuel fleet authorization, as the FAA calls it. And what did happen? Pretty much bupkis. In 2018, after almost five years and north of 30 million bucks, the FAA halted PAFI and declared the trial fuels were too different from 100 low lead and wouldn't serve for the entire fleet. No cigar, no drop-in. Had anyone bothered to look, this big long CRC report said that very thing eight years earlier. So Shell stopped work and Swift bailed on PAFI. And here we descend into the bottomless dark pit of approving an aviation fuel. Apparently there are two ways to do this. By doing a supplemental type certificate or STC that approves the new fuel for each airplane and engine by way of a long list called an approved model list or AML. Or the engines can be approved for a fuel literally by act of Congress in the FAA Authorization Act using a process specified by the administrator. Back to these GAMI guys. They specialize in aircraft modifications, so why not approve the fuel through an STC? The FAA hated the idea. Not how we do it. Not invented here. Too difficult. We'll try to stop you at every turn. Also, the GA industry was hostile to the idea. Well, okay, cold. The airframers have a love-hate relationship with STCs. They sometimes use them for things like props or seat belts, and Cessna even used one for a diesel engine in the 172 that they eventually canceled. Disdain for STCs is driven partially by liability, or so they want us to believe. Here's an example. Let's say that in addition to flapping my lips on YouTube, in my shop I develop an improved brake system for the 172. Much better than stock. It stops on a dime and gives you nine cents change but I mistakenly used some fittings from Harbor Freight. The brakes fail and the airplane careens into a schoolyard. Mm, my bad. I've got shallow pockets, so the plaintiffs will go after Cessna and Lycoming because although they had nothing to do with the accident, they have deep pockets. So if the STC fuel causes an accident, and it very well could, or the plaintiff's lawyers may think they can prove that it did, Cessna and Lycoming get sued. This may seem ridiculous, but these companies get sued all the time. But legal liability is equally true of any fuel, and anyone selling it is likely to have enough insurance to cover the risk. Still, the fuel better be right. This may seem straightforward enough, but not really. Proving a new fuel takes a lot of testing, and octane is only part of it. The GA piston fleet has a big range of engine types, from carbureted four-bangers like my Cub to the giant right R3350 duplex cyclone in the B-29. Yeah, and even the Merlin is still out there. Some airplanes have metal fuel tanks, some have rubber bladders, and some, like the Cirrus, contain the fuel in a composite wing cell. It'd be nice to know that a new fuel, which is likely to be heavily dosed with what are known as aromatic hydrocarbons, won't soften and weaken those materials or damage O-rings, hoses, and gaskets including the ones used for fuel storage and delivery. Drop-in fuel means that stuff won't have to be changed or modified. 
It would also be good if the fuel isn't so aggressive as to strip paint from the wings as one of the PAFI fuels actually did. So how do you get there? You start in the engine test cell with detonation trials across a range of operating conditions, mostly related to high temperatures, and then flight testing expands the envelope, including heating and cooling the fuel to see if the engine starts in extreme conditions or if the fuel gels or boils. You expose representative fuel systems like tanks, fuel lines, and O-rings to the fuel to include the materials in FBO pumps and trucks. Does the fuel cause deposits or varnish as it ages? Does it lose octane over time as 100 low lead does? Does it cause some weird vibrations that will cause props to go to pieces as is definitely the case with diesel engines because of their peaky power pulses? That's why diesels have composite props. We know that the FAA's PAFI program performs such tests, but despite it being a publicly funded effort, the details are kept hidden by the FAA because private companies are involved. The information is considered proprietary. GAMI, on the other hand, has been somewhat more transparent about its testing, although much of what it does remains proprietary. And just so you know, when a company applies for an STC, there's often a painful back and forth on the test program, but it's the FAA who specifies what has to be done and ultimately signs off on it and approves the results. Here's the list of GAMI's FAA supervised, accepted, and approved testing. They did the endurance testing with a long-term fleet trial at Embry-Riddle in Florida. All of this comprises hundreds of thousands of dollars in research and years of work. That's what George Brawley looked like 12 years ago when they started. This is what he looks like now. I look like this. Look at me now. Finally, last summer at AirVenture, that's 2021, the FAA surprised the world by approving the G100UL STC for a limited number of low horsepower engines. It asked GAMI to expand its testing to cover additional engines, which the company did, completing the work in the spring of 2022. The Wichita Aircraft Certification Office, which oversaw the GAMI project, sent the whole package off to FAA headquarters and said, this is done, approve it. And that's where it sits today. The FAA has been foot dragging since last winter and ordered a special technical advisory board, or TAB, to review the GAMI STC. Final action on that is uncertain, but it appears the FAA wants GAMI to provide so-called issue papers in five key areas, including detonation testing, endurance, materials compatibility, and hot weather operation. All of this has already been done in a test program approved by the FAA. Meanwhile, still insisting that PAFI was a huge success, the FAA has now enlisted the fuel industry, the aircraft manufacturers, and the alphabets to support another big program called EAGLE for Eliminate Aviation Gasoline Lead Emissions. This they propose to complete in eight years by the end of 2030. That'll be more than 30 years after lead was banned from car gas. As with PAFI, EGLE is government funded, and this is more or less the roadmap. All of this stuff has to be figured out, and it hasn't been yet. And this is what they want to happen. All these interests want a fuel that the FAA will bless for fleet authorization. You can imagine the ideal test program would put several fuels out there for significant fleet trials. Just spitballing here, say a couple of years and that would reveal any shortcomings. But who's going to pay for that? None of these companies want to. They want the FAA to pay for it. It should be obvious by now that the entire avgas replacement effort is mired in inertia, anchored in FAA and EPA ambivalence towards eliminating lead. The avgas producers, that would be Philips, Chevron, Exxon, and Shell, benefit from this muddle and have a vested interest in the status quo. Despite its small volume, leaded avgas turns a tidy profit, and it's a protected market because no new entrants will take on fooling with tetraethyl lead. So like PAFI before it, Eagle is likely to be a slow motion noise machine. Keep that in mind as you read news stories suggesting that this time we're really no kidding serious about eliminating lead from avgas. For AvWeb, 
I'm Paul Bergarelli reporting. Thanks for watching.